Well, it's a trillion dollar question. Why do so many startup companies come from one of the world's smallest nations? Here's Chris Mitchell with the answer. Israel is a nation of slightly more than 7 million people. Yet per capita, it leads the world in technology startup companies. One reason for Israel's leading role is its military and the kind of innovative leaders it produces. Veterans of the Israeli military, once they retire, they join the commercial market and they apply the different defense cutting-edge technologies into the medical market, telecommunications, uh, cel cellular uh, market, etc. As a result, Israel is credited with developing technologies like the cell phone, voice technology, and even the Intel Pentium chip. Israel also puts a premium on research and development. Israel has more people per capita in research and development than any other country. For example, in Israel, 140 people per 10,000 are in research and development. The U.S. is number two in the world with 85 people per 10,000. It just shows you how robust is the human factor here in Israel. And the outcome has been that Israel has produced per capita more cutting-edge technologies than any other country in the world. A new book called Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle, examines how tiny Israel is a technological giant in today's global economy. It argues Israel is not just a nation, but a state of mind. And its old-fashioned chutzpah goes a long way to its economic prosperity. It also shows how other nations and individuals can learn from Israel's example. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Well, author Dan Senor joins us now. Uh, Dan has written a book called Start Up Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle. Dan, good to have you with good us. Good to be with you, Pat. Thank always, you. Always a pleasure. What's the deal? Well, why is Israel doing this? I mean, they're, they're beating everybody. Well, it's amazing. As, as we talk about in the book, it, it's a state of mind. Yeah. It's the sense of survival. It's a sense of commitment. It's a sense of business success as a form of patriotism. We tell in the book these fantastic stories of amazing inventors and entrepreneurs. One guy, uh, uh, he started a company. And his son now runs it, and it's called Iskar. It's one of the largest yeah. tool manufacturing sure. companies in the world. Warren Buffett bought the company yeah, in 2006. And loves it. When Katusha rockets from Hezbollah yeah. were landing right near the factories during the Lebanon War, Warren Buffett could have gotten out of the deal. The CEO of the company called Warren Buffett and said, Warren, for our customers around the world and for you, there will be no war, meaning we don't care what the enemy throws at us. We will not be late on one shipment. It's this sense of Incredible. business success as a form of patriotism, of a sense of survival and tenacity that you don't see many places in the world. We argue in the book there's a lot that the U.S. can learn from Israel, and we actually talk about how. We, we know some of those early pioneers came in from uh, Eastern Europe, and they were socialist, and, and socialist is the all-embracing government. Now there's free enterprise, uh, you know, uh, on steroids. Well, what's the deal? Well, a couple of things. One, I think the government, we look at some of the innovative things the government did to liberate the economy and to really stimulate yeah. a venture capital industry. And, and there are some things we argue that the U.S. should be doing that we can learn from Israel. Secondly, you can't underestimate the role of the military. Yeah. Every single Israeli serves the military. That's, that's, everybody knows that. What pe most people don't realize, which we talk about in the book, is the Israeli business elites, mm -hmm. the corporate leadership, knows how to take the battlefield experience of Israel's young men and women and actually understand how valuable that leadership management, improvisational training is from the battlefield and how it is applicable to, to the business world. In the United States, we tell stories in the book. We interviewed U.S. officers mm -hmm. who tell stories about their the, you know, junior officers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. And they'll be in a job interview in the United States in Silicon Valley. And they'll describe this incredible experience they've had being a security czar, that reconstruction czar, the tribal negotiator, the amazing work our men and women are doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. At the end of the interview, the corporate recruiter will say, well, that's all very interesting, mm -hmm. but have you ever had a real job? <laughs> and this story goes on and on and on. It's the opposite in Israel where CEOs and investors are completely literate about military experience. And one of the things we talked about in the book is how we can learn from Israel's experience 
in integrating this incredible talent returning from our military into the business world. How do they uh, in the military learn things like computer chips? I mean, how, how do you learn a Pentium chip in, in the military? Well, the, is, the IDF has some very elite technology units uh -huh. um, that focus on um, training people in this incredible technology. Um, but that's only a small part of it. What is most valuable at the military experience is it takes every single young Israeli, mm -hmm. 18 to 21, they do their military service, then they go to university. So at, at, at a very young age, they get a crucible leadership experience. Oh, yeah. And that leadership experience, we argue, is what makes the business, the startup scene there tick because it is such valuable experience in the business world. They go to university at a much more mature age, 21, 22, when they've had to deal with real life and death experience. They know what it means to have lives on the line. Israel is surrounded by people who hate them. I was over there during that war when Hezbollah was throwing those Katusha rockets uh, into the country. Uh, how does Israel survive in this situation? Because those, those Arabs are way behind, but they, they hate Israel. They, apparently there's a jealousy out there. Well, absolutely. Look, we, we, one of the things we argue in the book, we, uh, we, we try to answer the question, if Israel has managed to pull this off, why hasn't the Arab Muslim world yeah. managed yeah. to pull it off? Well, there's a few problems. Okay. One, women aren't allowed to participate in the economy in the Arab Muslim world. That's a big problem. When 50% of your economy, 50% of your population is shut out, yeah. is basically persecuted, uh, that, that's, that's a real detriment to your economy. Two, there's no tolerance for asking basic questions in these societies. You can't challenge authorities. You can't challenge government economic data. You can't fire a government. If you don't have a culture where people can't ask questions of authorities and elites, you will not have a culture of exploration and experimentation. Yeah. What makes the Israeli economy so unique, we argue, is this complete tolerance for a asking questions, challenging. You've been there. You've seen what we call the chutzpah <laughs> and the <laughs> constant debating and probing. And you have to have that if you're going to try new ideas. The other point is, uh, in, in these societies, you, you don't have this tolerance for failure. You have to, in, in free, free markets, mm -hmm. you have to tolerate failure. People, you want your young people waking up every day, trying new ideas. In Israel, they try to radically turn industries upside down, yeah. coming up with new ideas in medical device and biotech and clean energy and all these different areas. You want them waking up every day, trying new ideas, knowing that they could fail. And if they fail, they can take that experience and try again if they can use it constructively. In the Arab Muslim world, you file for bankruptcy. If you fail, you get sent to jail. You're shut out of the economy forever. Mm. You're, you're never going to have a society of entrepreneurship and free markets if there's no tolerance for risk-taking and failure. What do you think is the future of Israel? I, uh, I'm very bullish, mm -hmm. uh, as we say in the New York business world, yeah. on, on Israel's future. I, we argue in the book they have managed, they were barely touched by this economic meltdown mm -hmm. globally. And we explain why Israel was the first out of the meltdown and they were barely touched by it. So they are incredibly resilient against immense odds, surrounded by enemies, in a state of war since its founding, no access to natural resources, the one slab of land in the Middle East with no oil, and shut out, as you just said, from, the, um, from its region. What worries me, what I keep, stay up at night thinking about, is the existential threat, security threat to Israel. We have a chapter in the book called The Threats to the Economic Miracle. Mm -hmm. What could go wrong? And one of them is if Iran develops a nuclear weapon. Oh, yeah. And we, for all the obvious reasons in terms of the security threats it would pose to Israel. But secondly, would some Israelis, we, we ask the question, would some Israelis say, enough is enough. I cannot live under the risk of a nuclear, uh, nuclear cloud. And will, they, the, will the talent leave? What is amazing is no matter what threats have been thrust at the Israelis, they've never left. Mm -hmm. They've stuck it out. They've kept building and building. We show how they've done it through every single war. You, you were there during the Lebanon War, yeah. and those companies kept functioning. Google, Microsoft, Intel, Cisco, they all have huge facilities there. We interview the leaders of their companies that say Israel is the only country in the world where they put their critical research and development, where they have their critical, you know, the companies live and die based on the work being done in Israel, which is an amazing thing because they're not worried about the existential threats. They're willing to take that risk. And... I, I think the Israelis will, too. Well, it's great. Well, Dan, this is a tremendous book, Startup Nation. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you ought to get this, and it'll thrill you to hear what Israel is doing, this tiny nation, how it's, uh, well, we think of them as God's chosen people, and, and that, uh, that uh, entrepreneurship uh, is almost divine. So thank and, you. and there's a lot we can learn from it. There's a, sure. lot, there's a lot of lessons in the book for the U.S. Well, it's yours, ladies and gentlemen, where books are sold all across this country. Dan, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much, Pat. Great to be with you. Dan, senior.